and welcome to Marxism Festival 2021 online and to this meeting, uh, Beyond Binaries and Bigots, Marxism, Gender and Trans Resistance. Uh, my name's B Hughes, uh, my pronouns are they, them, theirs, uh, and I'm a member of the Socialist Workers' Party in Liverpool uh, and a member of the University and Colleges Union um, and um, just been elected to the National Executive of ECU. So we have two brilliant speakers for you today. Uh, who I'll introduce uh, before they speak. Um, but first, just a little bit of Zoom housekeeping. Um, so for security reasons, the chat is off, so you can't chat to each other, uh, but you can message the hosts if you have any questions, either kind of about the meeting um, or you would like to ask a question but um, can't or don't want to put your hand up. Uh, we'll have both of our speakers um, first, who will speak for around 15 minutes each. Uh, and then we will open up the floor to discussion. So if you'd like to speak in the discussion section of the meeting, uh, please use your virtual hand on Zoom, which you can find either in the reactions tab or by opening the participants tab. It depends which version of Zoom you're using. So just you use the little blue Zoom hand. Um, and what I'll do is I will call two people at a time so you have a little bit of notice. Um, and if you're called to speak, you'll have three minutes. Uh, the timing is going to be very, very strict. Um, and when you have one minute left, I will show this sign uh, and I will interject and say one minute so you know that you need to wrap up. Um, and then at three minutes, I'll be waving this saying wrap up, please. And one of our tech team will be muting you if uh, you reach the, the three minutes. I know that seems really strict, but it's so we can get as many people as possible um, contributing to the meeting. Okay, so that's it for housekeeping, I think. Remember the chat is there if you need to contact the organisers um, and to use the virtual hands. So uh, we, I will now move on and introduce our first speaker. Um, Laura Miles is the author of Transgender Resistance, a member of the FWP and a former UCU national executive member. So over to you, Laura. Thanks very much, B. Um, thanks very much for the invitation to be on the, the panel with uh, Sally and looking forward to uh, a great discussion, hopefully. Um, I'm going to concentrate my contribution really on kind of trans lives and trans politics um, today. Um, so saying a bit about, you know, where we are, kind of how we got here and what we can do about it, I guess. <coughs> so it's fair to say, I think, that attacks on um, trans lives and rights have got considerably worse in recent times, especially in Britain. So trans and non-binary people have been consistently subject to misrepresentation and hostility in the press, on TV and radio and on social media. And this hasn't just been uh, in the obvious right wing rags like the Daily Mail railing against woke culture and minority rights and so on. Transphobic ar articles have appeared, unfortunately, in The Guardian, including one last weekend, um, as it happens, on Radio 4's Women's Hour, Women's Hour, and, and even the left-wing uh, Morning Star has given space to uh, Women's Place UK people, and they published a, a disgusting transphobic cartoon last year, which people may well have seen. Um, there are currently a couple of horrible transphobic books um, which have just come out, and there's a so-called educational film called dysphoria featuring various transphobic figures that's being pushed in social work education circles, which is frankly is undiluted anti-trans propaganda intended to dupe the unwary. There have also been a number of court cases intended to undermine trans people's access to medical care, to legal recognition and single sex spaces. Not all of these might be successful. Thankfully this week, the High Court threw out a legal challenge by the LGB Alliance, claiming that the Equality and Human Rights Commission's, the EHRC's advice on trans and non-binary people's access to single sex spaces as protected by the 2010 Equality Act was unlawful. But some cases have won, and whether they're ultimately successful or not, they all contribute to the stress and pressure that uh, trans people uh, face in, in their daily lives. There are two other appeals which are ongoing that people may have read about. One by the Tavistock Clinic, the main clinic for young trans people, against a really damaging High Court ruling late last year that restricted puberty blockers for young people. And also an appeal by the transphobe Maya Forstatter against an IT ruling that she was not, un not unlawfully dismissed from her job following a rash of 
transphobic tweeting. Uh, she's seeking to have her prejudices categorised as a philosophical belief and so protected under the 2010 uh, Equality Act. If the Tavistock appeal fails and if the Forstatter appeal wins, this will undoubtedly wrap up transphobia in Britain. So question is, one of the questions is why Britain in particular? Um, and, it, and it is particularly bad um, here. Well, I think a major contextual factor has been the historically very low levels of industrial struggle in recent years. Few strikes, low numbers of strike days, um, and the absolute failures by most union leaders to defend their members during austerity, right up to today, obviously, over the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. During rising or high levels of industrial struggle, people are much more focused on fighting the bosses and the government than on differences with fellow workers on the picket lines or those demonstrating with them. When that's not happening, all sorts of divisive and reactionary ideas, racist, sexist, transphobic, can get more traction. I think another major part of the answer to kind of why Britain has been the backlash from right wing bigots and parties, but also unfortunately from trans exclusionary radical feminists and a few people who consider themselves on the left, who are hostile to amendments to the Gender Recognition Act, which were proposed by the Parliamentary Women and Equalities Committee about four years ago. Various transphobic groups like Women's Place UK, Safe Schools Alliance, Fair Play for Women, the LGB Alliance have set themselves up to oppose and undermine trans rights on the totally false basis that trans rights undermine women's rights and that trans women are really men in drag and therefore, according to patriarchy theory, inherently violent. Shockingly, a week or two ago, the LGB Alliance was granted charitable status. They promptly published a full page ad in the Scottish Herald asking what is a lesbian? Clearly as an intervention in the Scottish elections, even though charities are supposedly barred from being political. The answer to what is a lesbian, according to the LGB Alliance, is that trans women cannot qualify as such. Surprise, surprise, because they're not women according to these biological flat earthers. Perhaps just as shockingly as the LGB Alliance actually getting charitable status is the fact that the EHRC supported their application, arguing that their views might be controversial, but they aren't extreme. These transphobic groups are happy to promote hostile social media platforms like Transgender Trend or Mumsnet to push their scaremongering propaganda about the supposed dangers of the trans lobby and transgender ideology and threats posed by trans women in particular accessing single sex spaces, which we've been doing for decades, by the way. But these are threats which for which there is, and we need to be really clear about this, no evidence. At the same time, they seem happy to turn a blind eye to the right wing anti women's rights credentials of many of those pushing this hate. For instance, the lawyer in the High Court Bell versus Tavistock case on puberty blockers was Paul Conrath, who's a well known anti abortion campaigner. Some of these people even seem prepared to turn a blind eye to the racist and anti Semitic conspiracy theorists who promote anti trans tropes based on upholding the sanctity of the nuclear family and the gender binary and belief in sex and gender essentialism. Claims that simply don't fit the facts of modern biological science, as I tried to show in my book, Transgender Resistance. In the US, there are currently around 100 anti-trans bills being pushed in dozens of state legislatures by Republicans, backed by ultra-conservative and far-right Christian organisations like the Alliance Defending Freedom, um, the Heritage Foundation and the Family Research Council. The reality is that both trans rights and women's rights, as well as LGBT plus rights in general, indeed the rights of all oppressed groups, are under serious assault by bigots and the right internationally, whose answer to the ongoing crises of capitalism is to ramp up authoritarianism, give the police and courts more powers to ban and attack protests, for example, the PCS bill currently, and roll back the gains that the struggles of anti-racist women's rights campaigners and LGBT plus people uh, have won. The appalling Sewell report uh, a few weeks ago is a case in point, a blatant attempt by hand-picked Tory stooges to deny the existence of institutional racism. Ideologically, transphobia fits right into this cesspit of authoritarianism, Islamophobia, racism against black, brown and indigenous people, migrants and refugees and anti-Semitic conspiracies. The deeper agenda is both fundamentally anti-democratic and anti-working class, part of the longer term neoliberal drive by the capitalist ruling class to narrow the state, redefine the citizen in very limited nationalist, religious and ethnic terms, so as to disenfranchise those deemed other 
from welfare and social services, secure employment, decent housing and their human rights. The purpose is to ramp up the exploitation of workers' labour power to restore declining rates of profit in the system and stabilise the inherently unstable capitalist financial system. The biggest cover for this reactionary ideological agenda is to accuse trans people and their supporters of promoting something called gender ideology, otherwise known as the idea that men and women are equal, and transgender ideology, that gender identity is a real thing and should be respected. The right, especially the religious right, are also pushing the idea that being trans, this is a new one, is a religion tagged as secular humanism and support for trans people therefore should be deemed counter to United States constitutions which debar state support for religions. This is analogous to the French notion of laicite being used there to attack Muslims, religious symbols and dress and so on. So on the basis that transness is a religion, trans people should be denied full citizenship, including access to state medical facilities, targeted health provision, health insurance, education, welfare services, and so on. Implicitly, of course, this is all about promoting dominant Christian white supremacist authoritarianism in the interests of the ruling class. Faced with these attacks, surely the first response of any socialist or all progressive ought to be solidarity with the oppressed people under attack. It's pretty disappointing and unacceptable that some feminists and some on the left are providing left cover for this assault through their transphobia. Socialists should never promote the self-defeating idea that the rights of one oppressed group underlie, undermine those of another, and that they're the enemy rather than the capitalist class who use oppression and division to defend their wealth and power in a brutalizing system of growing inequality, wars and existential challenges to humanity. Transphobia, like any oppression, is therefore absolutely a class issue. It's in the direct interest of all working class people, not just trans people, to challenge it just as it is other forms of oppression like racism, sexism and anti-Semitism. We need to fight for both women's rights and trans rights as a victory for one is also a victory for the other. I could have spent my whole contribution giving you example after example of the attacks trans people are facing, like the refusal last autumn of Johnson's government to implement self-identification uh, in the Gender Recognition Act, which already exists in various other countries, like Ireland, by the way, with no discernible problems. Yes, last week, they did reduce the cost of applying for a gender recognition certificate to five pounds from 140 pounds, but it's an insulting sop when compared to what they should have done. In other words, introduce a free legal process for self-identification rather than the lengthy medicalized procedure under the 2004 Act. Instead, trans and non-binary people are faced with large rises in reported hate crimes, the serious impact of the pandemic lockdowns on access to counselling, medical intervention, and waiting times for first appointments at gender clinics that, that have extended to several years. The fact that the media and social media hostility has resulted in over half of trans people saying that they're afraid to use public toilets and changing rooms, or abroad, the hundreds of Polish towns and cities now boasting that they're LGBT zones, LGBT free zones, or the recent Hungarian law that took away trans people's rights at a stroke, or the Florida law passed a couple of weeks ago that trans girls can be subject to genital inspections if they want to sp play sports with other girls. This is being applauded by some radical feminists and gender critics, by the way, but how is such child abuse and humiliation any sort of feminism? And what about the recent letter of reassurance Boris Johnson sent to a religious organisation that signalled, despite promises to ban it, inhuman gay and trans conversion therapy, that any new Tory legislation will include exemptions for religious organisations to carry on converting, carry on abusing LGBT plus people. Transphobia has also become, as many people will know, a significant issue in various political parties like Labour and the Scottish National Party or the sex pest Alex Salmon's New Alba party. Um, some unions have become battlegrounds too in recent times, especially the education unions, and we, and we need to tackle it head on. Thankfully, and this is a cause I think for hope, in what might seem an otherwise gloomy scenario, transphobic voices are clearly a minority, even if sometimes way too loud and way too influential in some quarters. For instance, in every union, 
where trans hostile motions have been raised have been knocked back, usually by large majorities. At Leeds University a few weeks ago, an attempt by senior management to replace a good trans policy with a toothless alternative was knocked back by a vigorous joint campaign of staff unions and, and the students' union. It certainly seems to me that young people in particular generally have no truck with transphobes. Their activism in anti-racist and climate change campaigns starts from empathy with all the oppressed. Think of the number of placards supporting Black Trans Lives Matter during the BLM protests, for example, last year. And where there were protests last year during the pandemic, demanding gender recognition amendments and opposing transphobia, some of them actually organised by some of our SWP members, including in Leeds, where I live, they've been well, su support, well supported and successful. So socialists should, should defend trans and non-binary people's rights to define their own oppression, to assert their bodily autonomy, to demand better resources, affirmative intervention, trans inclusive policies and equality in all workplaces. Not least because we know that all the reputable evidence shows that gender variant people, especially young people, are less prone to suicidal ideation, depression and self-harm. Indeed, they can thrive when they get access uh, when they can access sympathetic, affirmative and supportive care. It's right that socialists should recognise trans women as women, trans men as men, and non-binary is, is a valid identity worthy of respect. And it's right too to say that transphobia and trans rights are not up for debate, just as we wouldn't debate racism or sexism or anti-Semitism. Trans people's existence is not something to be debated by transphobes and gender critical uh, people. Transphobia has to be opposed, not accommodated. While we don't call for no platforming transphobes and gender critics, as we would for fascists, uh, we are for opposition and protest. It's sheer hypocrisy when transphobic and gender critical people claim they're being silenced and their free speech and academic freedom undermined, when what they really want is to use their considerable public and academic platforms to promote transphobia without criticism. This shouldn't be indulged by institutions like university. The truth is it's largely trans and non-binary voices that are not being heard. So I just I want to round up because I'm near the end of my time now. Trans people should be encouraged to be active in the trade unions and get involved in the united fronts that we need, like stand up to racism, people before profit and so on, fighting from below to collectively challenge Tory attempts to make us pay for the pandemic. Hopefully, uh, my book is a useful tool in offering a Marxist understanding of the roots of transphobia as lying in the emergence of class societies and the nuclear family model, in showing how trans people have existed throughout human history in every epoch, and in showing that the fight for, for LGBT plus rights has been part of the left's struggles since the earliest socialist organisations. But there's another key argument in my book that I'll end my contribution with, and it's that while we need to fight to defend and extend trans rights in the here and now, as long as we're doing this within capitalism, the very system that's given rise to transphobia and homophobia and perpetuates these in order to divide and blunt working class resistance, there's always the danger, as we're seeing now, of those rights being attacked. If we want trans liberation, not just potentially fragile trans rights, that means fighting for a revolutionary transformation of the very system itself. It means recognising that the real enemy of the working class and oppressed people is the capitalist ruling class, wedded to an increasingly unequal and brutal system that's daily inflicting horrendous damage on the environment, the ecosystem and humanity itself. As Lenin said over 100 years ago, Revolutions are the festivals of the oppressed and exploited. And the Bolsheviks who led the Russian Revolution class to victory in 1917 in their own festival of the, of the oppressed and exploited within weeks had decriminalized homosexuality and massively improved the rights of women, national minorities and workers in general. No, that didn't survive Stalin's counter-revolution in the 1920s, but their brilliant example is there for today's activists to learn from. So all of us can be part of the fight back today to take on transphobia. We can mobilise and we can marginalise the transphobes and roll back the bigots. But the key to ultimate success in achieving the liberation that can free everyone, trans and cis, from the tyranny of the gender binary, in my view, has to include building a revolutionary socialist organisation capable of achieving that transformation, one based on understanding that all the oppressed and exploited have an interest in being part of the struggle for a better world, a socialist world. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much, Laura. Um, that was brilliant. So I'm going to move straight on um, to our second speaker. And um, after this speaker, we'll be starting to take contributions from the floor. So you can start thinking about your contributions and getting your little blue Zoom hands raised. 
Um, so our next speaker is Sally Campbell, author of A Rebel's Guide to Rosa Luxemburg. Over to you, Sally. Okay, thanks. Um, so I want to try and look a bit behind some of the issues that Laura has raised and look a bit more at some of the theoretical questions around gender, sex, identity, which some, which as Laura's talked about, some feminists and some socialists seem to be tying themselves up in knots about and not managing to come out with the support for trans, uh, trans rights and trans people that, that they should be doing. Um, Laura mentioned that there's a number of uh, kind of transphobic books and, and stuff coming out. There's a, a book that just came out this week um, by a uh, trans critical feminist called Kathleen Stock. And the book is called Material Girls, Why Reality Matters for Feminists uh, and for Feminism. And I think, actually just, I haven't read the book yet because it just came out two days ago, um, but I just, Think we should take a moment appreciate the really patronizing tone of the subtitle there you know to talk about reality because i think reality when we're talking about trans people and trans lives is what laura just outlined it's all of those attacks that people are facing it's all of that oppression that is being ramped up actually by uh, by the attacks taking place um, at the moment but i think what what kathleen stock means when she talks about reality is coming to this argument that gender identity is just a feeling. Um, it's not something that's real, that's rooted um, in, on biological facts or, you know, for, for some on socialized gender experience. Um, so the, these are the kind of things that, that I want to look at. Um, you know, because there, there's a whole number of feminists and, and some socialists who have this kind of critique of gender identity and, um, you know, are concerned that somehow this is being prioritized over, um, you know, the, the kind of biological um, basis of what a woman is. Um, and this is a problem if you're starting from feminism as your political outlook. Now, um, people should read Laura's book, Transgender Resistance. She talks in that about um, gender identity and really talks about it as a very real thing that is made up of a complex interaction between an individual sense of self, um, their relationship to their own biological being, their relationship to the society that they live in, really. It's not something that's easily definable or, or able to be kind of pinned down, but it's something that is very real. Although, to be honest, even if it were just a feeling, I think when you listen to the accounts that people have and the, you know, the, the stories that people, trans people have talked about, you know, the effect that having your you know, gender identity denied by society, the effect that that has, then I don't think that's something that should be dis dismissed anyway. But I think as, as Laura outlines, it's something that's a lot deeper than that, this, this complex interaction really, that is absolutely rooted in a person's material circumstances. And I think that's something we should think about as, as Marxists, that material circumstances doesn't just mean biology, it means you know, that the environment that we live in, the way that we interact with each other um, as physical beings and the way that crucially in which we meet our needs um, as a society, you know, our basic needs. Now, so for some uh, trans critics, some of these kind of feminists will argue very vociferously, you know, not everyone has a gender identity, you know, it's not something that should be used, uh, you know, as, as a marker. Now, I don't know that, you know, um, I don't, know if everyone has a gender identity or, or, or what, but I do know that if your gender identity is at odds with the way that you are, you know, the gender that's assigned to you by society, um, then you're going to be very aware of it. And that's why this is something that's become a debate now, as trans people have become more confident, um, more willing to fight and have been, you know, kind of coming out uh, and, and creating all of these new struggles over their right to live um, as they should be able to. Um, and this is something that's not absolutely not trivial and, and not a whim. Now, there are different approaches, I think, on the left and uh, among feminists to questions around gender and sex. Of course, in the mainstream, the kind of the common sense view in our society is that gender and sex, biological sex are effectively the same thing. 
uh, and that one leads to the other. You know, so our ideas about femininity and masculinity simply come from the fact that women have babies and men go out hunting or whatever. And this means that women are naturally more caring and men are naturally more you know, outgoing and, uh, and aggressive, uh, etc. All, all of those things that we know are meant to go along um, with our gender. You know, those kind of ideas uphold the status quo. They uphold the ideology of the nuclear family of the kind of heteronormative relationships that most people find themselves in because actually it's quite hard to live any other way in this society. You know, and anyone who deviates from those norms, whether because they're trans, they're gay, they're gender non-conforming, they're not willing to live in that kind of family setup and so on, becomes a problem for that kind of common sense uh, view. Now, unfortunately, there's always been, you know, some bits of, of feminism that mirror that view effectively and that root women's oppression in their biology. And I think someone like Catherine Stock, you know, she, she does this. Uh, so in a talk she gave last December, she is talking about the problem of the, you know, the kind of postmodern politics that she sees as, as the problem today that talks about social construction of gender. Um, and she says, with this kind of view, woman is no longer a descriptive concept that helps us communicate about a natural category of people. You know, I think there's quite a lot of work being, ideological work being done in that sentence about what is a natural category and why we, you know, why we would choose this one as the, the unit of our struggle, if you like. Um, she says things like, I think feminism should acknowledge that the interests of women and men are not exactly the same. Men and women are two different kinds of people with some shared needs and interests, but also many competing ones. Uh, sexual dimorphism, plus for the majority of sexual interest in the opposite sex produces distinctive masculine and feminine patterns of behavior, et cetera, et cetera. You know, she does talk about the cultural kind of ways in which we're shaped in terms of our gender, but that really comes later. You know, she's effectively rooting women's oppression in our biology. Now, biology isn't as simple as we're led to believe. You know, it's not something I've got time to go into now, but, you know, uh, in terms of our biological makeup, there, there really is a spectrum. Now, most people will fit into what we call male or female. Um, but I think for us, the more important question is to ask why it is that in our society, such value is placed on certain biological markers over others. Why is it that whether someone is male or female is so important to know that people in America are starting forest fires with their gender reveal parties um, for, for their babies? You know, like this is the most important thing about a new baby is whether it's a boy or a girl, that's the main thing we have to know. You know, and all of the other consequences, you know, the much more important ones that, that shape our whole lives and the way that society um, is set up. Um, biology is not our destiny. This is a slogan from the women's liberation movement you know, that people like Catherine Stock were probably a part of and certainly would have supported, but seem to have maybe forgotten a little bit. I think biology tells us very little about how we should organize society. Um, biology is not the root of women's oppression. Now, lots of people at the moment like misquoting, I think, or misusing Engels' work on the origins of um, women's oppression. When he wrote The Origin of the Family, Private Property and the State, he very clearly is making the point that what changes in human society at some point is the um, the material changes that lead to the division of society into classes into social classes the separation of production and reproduction you know these are the things he's talking about it's about the organization of people in society it's not about our biology which hasn't really changed you know fundamentally in a very very long time now so those who say they're being materialist by rooting women's oppression in biology are actually, I think, being very crude. Um, a Marxist approach is historical. Uh, when we talk about material circumstances, they don't start and end with your own body. Material circumstances are broader than that, um, as I've already said. And we recognize, the, a key to it is about recognizing change and transformation over time. It's about new developments in knowledge, you know, discoveries and scientific development, new ideas, new methods of meeting our needs as a society. Crucially, it's about those struggles that exploited and oppressed people wage against their oppressors and which open up new ideas, new ways of understanding ourselves. 
you know, and, and new vocabularies to express the needs of that movement um, as it as it develops. We don't say that biology is a fixed and changing thing over here, you know, on one hand, and ideology is this thing that just floats around completely separate from it on the other hand. We say that these things are, are rooted in each other, you know, they, they're connected. Um, and, you know, and change and develop. Um, we start from the real circumstances that people have inherited, including their bodies, but we also um, recognize that those people change and shape the world around them and, and themselves. So another side of the argument that some feminists put is that we're made through our experience of oppression, that women become women by growing up as girls, learning all the behaviors we're meant to exhibit, experiencing sexism, you know, and this, and this is, you know, very, this is a very important thing to, to recognize. I vividly remember the first time I was catcalled and it changed me as a person forever. You know, you can't go back once that happens. You know, these things are really important. However, you know, the implication from, the, from some feminists is that therefore if, you know, if a trans woman was, was raised as a boy, they won't have gone through that experience. But I think that also makes a very big assumption that somehow, you know, a, a, a trans woman who was raised as a boy was simply going through exactly what other boys went through. Uh, as they were growing up, and I think that's um, that's very wrong uh, assumption to make, you know. And I think again, it's worth reading the kind of stories of, of trans people themselves about their experiences of growing up, you know, feeling absolutely um, ill at ease all the time, and that's the least of it, really, with with how they're how they're perceived uh, and treated by others. I think the question of what it means to be a woman is something that we've always debated in, in the feminist movement or in the women's liberation movement. And the, one of the debates that has had to be had again and again, and I think is now being had again, is that there is not one common experience that all women share. Women is not one homogenous group. Um, part of the reason that the women's liberation movement uh, kind of um, collapsed really last time around was because um because the you know the kind of white middle class women who tended to dominate in the movement particularly in the us didn't listen to and recognize and understand the experiences of black women of poor women of working class women of latina women you know etc you know there were all kinds of different ways of experiencing life um, as a woman and that can include trans women i don't see why this is any more of a problem than recognizing all the other multiple ways that, that women live already. You know, this is why as socialists, we don't actually start from the question of oppression as where do we look for a group which can lead a, a transformation of society? Because we recognize a very different, you know, the divides within oppressed groups. Um, our starting point is solidarity um, with trans people who are experiencing the real attacks right now, just as we stand in solidarity with migrant women, with black women facing racism uh, and so on. I think gender is one way that people are finding to express something very real about themselves, about how they fit or they don't fit in the world as it is and, and how they want the world to change so that, so that it fits better with, with their needs. I think it's fantastic that there's a new vocabulary around these questions. And it's one that raises questions for everybody about how they see themselves, how they understand themselves. Uh, and the limits of the categories that we currently have to describe people. I have no idea what will happen in a future society. Um, you know, in a society free from division and, and oppression and exploitation, would gender disappear or would gender proliferate? Uh, you know, I don't know. I certainly hope that in a future society, gender would cease to be something that defines your life possibilities, you know, cease to be something that can lead to oppression and being held back um, uh, because of it. But the way that we see gender in the future will be something that is decided by those people who are making the new world, isn't it? It's something that will be shaped and, uh, and created in the course of those struggles to, uh, to transform the world. I think those socialists and feminists today who say we're collapsing into postmodernism by supporting trans rights or by recognizing the existence of gender identity, need to go back and reread Marx's thesis on Feuerbach 
and I'd recommend everyone to do this, very short, there's 11 sentences basically. And one of the points that he's making in that, I think, is give me an idealist who recognises the need for intervention in the world to change it over a crude materialist who can't see that any day of the week, you know. So I think unless we start from solidarity with uh, trans people, you know, you don't need to believe in gender identity to recognise the oppression that people are facing. You need to stand with them and, and fight to defend their rights. But only if we start with solidarity do we really earn the right to debate the origins of trans oppression, to debate the different um, strategies to overcome it. And I think that's the position um, we take as socialists today.